everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to this edition of Talk of the Town. I am joined today by somebody that I spoke with when she was first in her job uh, about five years ago, almost actually to the day or week. Um, and she is Sarah Bird. She is the Director of School Counseling and Social Emotional Learning. Um, and I spoke to her as I said, five years ago, just after taking that job, some, some months into her first year, as our first SEL um, director for the Arlington Public Schools. And um, I asked Sarah to come back in today um, because we have a number of things that we'd like to talk about. We want to kind of follow up on some of the conversation that we had all those many years ago before, uh, uh, let's see, a little event known as the uh, COVID pandemic hit. Um, but also to discuss um, partly the numbers and more the significance of a report that Sarah recently delivered to the school committee here in town. Um, the title of the report, I'll read it, it's long. It's the Universal Mental Health Screening and SEL Assessment in Arlington Public Schools. And it covers a lot of ground and Sarah is um, in complete command, I noticed. Uh, of its content. So um, this, I warn everybody, is going to be a kind of free-ranging conversation. Um, Sarah and I talked a little bit about what we're, ground we're going to cover, but there is much to be discussed here. So bear with us. I'm sure it will be worth it. Anyway, thank you for coming in. Really Absolutely. appreciate it. You are one busy woman, and we really do appreciate uh, the time. So I actually wanted to ask you to just to start with, um, SEL is something that you are, you know, you wake up every day living and breathing and um, probably lots of people in our audience are aware. Mm -hmm. But let's just assume or let's let, let us speak to those yeah. for whom they're tuning in and they're like, okay, so what are you talking about here? Sure. So what, tell us about SEL, give us the basics. Yeah, and it's, uh, thank you for asking that too because it's a, a term or an acronym that we toss around and not everybody has the same universal understanding of what we're talking about. So in schools and in communities and even in homes, social emotional learning, which is the SEL that we're talking about, are the, the habits, the thoughts, the patterns, the behaviors that we are supporting and fostering and encouraging with our students. Specifically, in Arlington Public Schools, we use the five basic competencies that the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning has researched and used and really vetted and endorsed across the country and the world. So those five competencies that we're talking about are the same across all age spans, even into adulthood. Mm -hmm. So they're the same competencies that you and I are using right now. Um, I we mean, <laughs> well, we're using them, whether or not we're using them well, well. <laughs> or they need some help, it's, it's up to our own assessment every day. And it's just like any skill set, right? It's, uh, if we're sick, they're going to be you know, a little weaker. And if we're having a great day, they're going to be stronger, right? So those, let me tell you what they are. They are self-awareness, they are social awareness, they are self-management, they are relationship skills and responsible decision-making. And those five skills are the same for, you know, if you're looking at a three-year-old or a four-year-old, they're gonna be developmentally different there. Mm -hmm. But you can still ask a three-year-old or a four-year-old how they're feeling, what's their self-awareness. You can have reasonable expectations for how they're managing themselves. You can teach them how to have age-appropriate relationships. You can teach them how to make good decisions. Same thing for you and I, you know, how are we socially aware of one another? Are we self-aware? Are we managing how we're feeling right now? Did we make responsible decisions to get here? And so on and so forth, right? So those skills are never ending in their development, in our reflection of them, and in schools, we really need to um, make space in terms of how we're coaching students in them, intentionally naming them, and providing opportunities to allow students to practice them in culturally appropriate ways. Because, you know, in my Italian Portuguese household, having um, 
you know, a conflict and making decisions when it's a holiday and it's loud and it's noisy and you want food at the end of the table is going to look very different than somebody else's household that's maybe smaller. You know, my husband has a much smaller family. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that decision making and that relationship and that conflict is going to look very different. So, you know, not naming this is what it needs to look like but asking us to be self-reflective and socially aware of, well, what's it look like in your family? What's it look like in your family? And working with students to articulate and figure out, oh, that's how that's gonna work for me. Yeah, and as you talked, you know, as you kind of listed those five pillars and, and, and also, you know, uh, kind of dis went into like a little bit further description for a couple of them at least, I'm thinking, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, yeah, you're right that you can, you can ask that of a three-year-old or mm -hmm. you can, help teach a three-year-old how to do these things. But I also know plenty of adults, plenty of folks my age and above, below, et cetera, uh, who, have, who would have some challenges yeah. at responding to some of those basic questions. How do I feel? Yeah. <laughs> you know, et cetera. So clearly uh, lifelong stuff, but of course now, and it's, it's partly your, the scope of your work to uh, integrate that within, uh, you know, our students' experience mm -hmm. in schools um, from, I, I assume, right, from pre-K and yes. kindergarten right all the way through high school. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, um, especially in the school-based setting, we're not structured as a school where there's a separate SEL curriculum time. You know, we have specific instructional time for math and for English and science and social studies and PE and, and so on but there's no SEL instructional time for the most part. Uh, it would be, in an ideal world, it would be lovely to have a bit of instructional time set aside for that so we could teach some of our SEL curriculum lessons. But for the most part, we're left to take those, uh, those five different competencies and embed them into existing content, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is ideal because that's how our brain functions. Um, and that's also how we function and we learn in social settings, right? So when you read books about different characters, you're not just reading about where they go and what they do. You hear about how they're feeling and their relationships and what drives them to make a decision and the you know, risks and rewards of what choices they can make. And then they make a choice and then you see the fallout from it. And, and there's all of that energy and that drama in the story. That's all emotion. That's all SEL. And so when we have teachers naming those competencies within the literacy moments, mm -hmm. that's when the learning's really rich because they're talking about and teaching and practicing the SEL competencies within the context of the, the literature. Same thing with even science. You know, you can have chemical compounds that are having certain reactions towards one another and you can talk about, oh, is this a base, is this a, an acid and how are they reacting? And, um, and in history, I love, you know, going through historical figures and thinking about what were their leadership styles? You know, mm -hmm. how did they lead their people, even current events, and thinking about how can we be using the different competencies to reflect on our reactions to what's going on in the world, um, how different choices could be made, what are responsible choices, how do we manage our feelings and our reactions to what's going on. So it's really rich. Yeah, and, and again, as you're speaking, I'm thinking pedagogically, it's also a very useful tool uh, for teachers just in terms of um, imparting content and, um, and giving uh, students a way to connect mm -hmm. with the material. Yeah. Um, so clearly, I'm sure, you know, it in, the, the work you're doing involves working directly with teachers, working directly with students, but doing an awful lot of indirect, invisible mm -hmm. kind of scrambling behind the scenes, I would think, uh, in order to be able to, you know, do this successfully. Um, I want to change, not, not change gears for a second, but I, I, I had told you that I reviewed our first, um, our first interview a number of years ago, and I was really struck by one thing because, of course, n neither of us could possibly, nobody could, see the pandemic over the horizon at that point. <laughs> um, but one of the things that you said, and I'm going to quote your actual words to you, um, which I wrote down, um, was you were talking about um, how school is, is, a, is a great place for social emotional learning to happen, how it is the place to happen. And you were saying that now young people don't come to school to get information, as was the case at some point in the past. 
Um, they can do all that virtually. They don't need us for that. What they do need us for is to figure out who they are in context of the world around them. Um, that came from a, uh, a more innocent time, right? When we were assuming that we were going to uh, be, that you would have assumed that you'd be able to continue the work that you had begun at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was based on certain premises like, hey, we're all gonna be here together each and every day. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we get the intervention of the pandemic. People mm -hmm. are forced, are, are kind of atomized, right? Like we're all now just in our little, in our little pods or in our little in our little spaces, and we're not in community. Um, how, you know, just talk to us a little bit about how that has been, given that you were, mm -hmm. you know, optimistic um, about the. You, you know, the, the potential for this work that you do and how it could, you know, in a span of five to seven years, because I asked you to, you know, yeah. like actually speculate what would it be like. Um, you know, your, the, the, the vision you painted was, was a, a, a nice one, which was then completely shanghaied <laughs> uh, in a sense. So sure. both on a personal level to, to yeah. whatever degree you're willing to share that. And then professionally, how have you reacted, adjusted? Uh, what you, what have you learned? These kinds of, you know, okay. anything there that you want to address? Sure. Personally, I am an optimist, and professionally, I am also. Uh, I practice radical acceptance from years of being a therapist. Right, so. The, you get the, the duality of those two hand in hand. And what that's done for me throughout the pandemic is to say, there are a lot of things that the pandemic has done for the field of social emotional learning that has been very helpful to, to the work and putting it as a priority. You know, social emotional learning is something that only um, people would only pay lip service to, or people would say, oh yeah, it's this touchy feely thing. You know, it's really great in elementary schools, or um, it has to do with puppets. I don't know. You know, it would be sort of discarded and um, and left for pre-K. And then when the pandemic came and hit, and families, you know, even if you believed in your in your gut that this was something that was important, I think a lot of families that have healthy kids and kids that were pretty much taking care of themselves and doing just fine were now believing, well, maybe this is for everybody. Maybe this is actually something we could all benefit from. And maybe we're advocating for this for all of us in community all the time, because this has now thrust all of us into the spotlight to say, now that my student has been away from their classroom, and now that they're just looking at them on the screen, and now that they've been removed from this everyday protective factor, because that's what it is to be in community, to be with friends, to be in spaces where you feel competent and confident mm. is actually a huge boon to, to your existence, to your identity, to who you are. And all of the families of, you know, no matter what grade level, elementary, middle, high, started to see what it was like to have a student slowly withdraw and, and not Nothing pathological. We're not talking about kids with diagnoses here. We're not talking about kids with any, you know, neurological issues or needing medication. Just that slow removal, mm -hmm. and we all felt it ourselves mm -hmm. too. There, all of a sudden, came this mass advocacy for social emotional learning is important. We need to get these kids, and that you saw that as a push to get kids back in. You saw that as a push for um, vaccines or whatever it was that we needed to get them back in community. You saw that uh, even locally for how can we get the rotating schedule to get them back in in a safe way. You know, however it was that families found they could advocate to get their students in community learning pods. You know, whatever it was that worked, families were advocating for some type of social emotional learning to manifest for their student to be held in community again. Mm -hmm. So that's the optimism in me that looked at, at the pandemic and said, people have lived it, they get it now because it's almost like you don't know what you've got till it's gone mm -hmm. type of a moment, mm -hmm. right? And then that radical acceptance part of me is looking at all of this and saying, 
and yet it's still not going to be perfect because what we have now been left with is this tidal wave or these repercussions of kids coming back in and having these gaps or these years of interrupted mm -hmm. learning. And so, you know, my daughter was in kindergarten when the pandemic started. She's now in second grade. And so she has, if you think about it, when she comes into second grade and you realize that her whole first grade year was kind of mushy and then her kindergarten year was interrupted. So the first, when she came back to second grade, her whole set her toolbox of skills was a, a half finished toolkit from kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And as teachers are coming into that and going, oh my gosh, that means like the fourth grade and fifth grade students are coming in with toolkits from like first grade and second grade. And then freshmen are coming in with toolkits from middle school, maybe fifth grade. That's, that gives you so much compassion for the kids, for the teachers, for the families to realize that there's the potential for huge hiccups in terms of, I missed the lesson where you talk to the bully on the playground. I missed the lesson where somebody teases you to your face and you don't know what it feels like to just turn red mm -hmm. and want the world to swallow you up. And we just didn't have those lived experiences. So yeah, I'm just gonna interrupt for a second yeah. because you're, you're talking about missing toolkits, right? Because again, these, we have this gap of a couple of years. And, and to me, it, it sounds then like you are um, acknowledging, in, in a way, that the that SEL demands, like SEL progress demands community, mm -hmm. demands that we be face to face with each other yeah. out on the playground or in the classroom or in the hall or wherever, um, and yeah. that basically taking that away just created a gap for everybody. There was no way to keep moving forward with that in, in a virtual way. Is that is that right? Yeah, and, you know, a gap compared to what? So we're all in this together, so we all have this blip mm -hmm. on our radar, right? I think there's, there's this temptation to compare it to the normal from before. And sure, okay, there's this gap compared to before, but we've all got this hiccup together. So uh, that's where the radical acceptance comes in, to mm -hmm. say... Yes, and let's all learn together. Let's all have this lesson together. So there's some research that comes out of ROCKS, um, R-O-X, Ruling Our Experiences, that was uh, looking into adolescent girls and trying to find out during the pandemic how they were feeling. And one of the major findings was that they were feeling like they had no vision for their future. They weren't quite sure, they couldn't envision what a future might look like because colleges were shut down, they couldn't envision going to high school because they weren't having course selections and things. And those are not things that I would have anticipated or seen because we were focused so much on how are you doing in the moment right now. Mm -hmm. So even just mm. listening to them and finding out, oh, you're struggling now because you have no compelling vision for the future, that's worth listening to them and just sort of accepting right now is what it is. The lessons we've missed are the lessons we've missed. Let's radically accept where we're at and recalibrate and figure out, okay, what do you need? How do we move forward? And if our adolescent girls were looking for, well, what does my future look like now? What does college look like now? Or do I even want to go to college now? That was compelling. And teen and adolescent girls really get a sense of identity and purpose and belonging from community. And them not being immersed in that was really jeopardizing that sense of compelling future. Mm -hmm. So also hearing that and saying, we've got to get them back in community. We've got to get them connected to one another. How do we create opportunities for that? Mm -hmm. That's also really compelling information to hear from them. So what, what, has, what have things looked like um, this year mm -hmm. um, for you and kind of broadly speaking in the SEL world sure. of Arlington Public Schools? Um, you know, given everything you, you, you've just said, sure. I mean, everybody finally is back yep. to some, some semblance of normal, normalcy. And so how do you pick those reins mm -hmm. back up again? Or I, I, sure. I, don't even, I don't even know how to ask the question. Sure. Even. Well, you know, I can start just realistically um, in terms of programming, right? So this, um, this year we have been able to take the second step 
social emotional learning curriculum at the elementary level across the district in all seven buildings and with the help of our SEL coach and then this infusion of a new grant funded SEL coach to move through the buildings and work with classroom teachers to support them in implementing just a couple of units to start grappling with, like we said, do you have instructional time for it? And if you don't, how can we help you infuse this into some of your other mm. learning spaces? That's new for a lot of a lot of folks. We have responsive classroom in, in all of our buildings. And again, though, given the pandemic, we have to onboard new folks with responsive classrooms. So the past few years have been a bit of a scramble. We've done some you know, interim trainings to get people on board with the same language. But a lot of it is also playing catch up, getting people trained who haven't been trained, giving them materials when they haven't had it. And a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching for folks who are new to it or could use a refresher. So it's a lot of, like you said, scrambling the background, but also getting into classrooms and meeting with teachers and finding out, okay, the fourth graders that are in front of you look a lot like first graders. Let's put the fourth grade materials to the side and actually go back to the third or the second grade materials and let's use them for now because that's actually going to best serve the students in terms of SEL curriculum. Right. I'm not right. talking about yeah. the academic yeah. content. And let's see if that's going to help them meet their needs and make them feel more competent and confident in their learning space as a community. Mm -hmm. And those types of adaptations and coaching are really helpful. At the secondary level, uh, we've been uh, working with a program called RULER, which is really dynamic because, and, and it stands for regulating, understanding, labeling, expressing, and um, I'm sorry, recognizing and regulating, two R's, I flipped them. Mm -hmm. But all the different emotional fluency elements like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So having the adults actually this year immerse themselves in that program so that they can get really confident with, wow, how am I feeling? Tired's not the right word, that's a biological feeling, but I'm feeling a little conflicted or I'm feeling a little distressed or I'm feeling kind of apprehensive and excited. You know, actually getting feelings words so that we can then model that for students and start to increase their emotional mm -hmm. fluency. So that's what we've been seeing in terms of programming, in terms of feelings and experiences. It, oh, it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, yeah, it's especially because really I mean, you 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 know, as you were just pointing out, it 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 is glaringly obvious that the load on teachers and the load on the SEL coach and mm -hmm. coaches, um, the mm -hmm. load on you, uh, et cetera, it, it's it, it's all been bottlenecked, right? So yes. now, how to both backfill and keep moving forward, and mm -hmm. you know, again. Mm -hmm. Uh, on some level, we can't keep going, you know, you can't go forward um, teaching fourth graders as if they were second graders, whether right. it's SEL or, or the actual, you know, content. Mm -hmm. um, and yet that is, that is the right thing to do now. So how to figure out how to close that right. gap as you continue to move forward. It's just, it's just a good illustration of how challenging things are yeah. um, in, in our schools right now, just to do right by our students, which is mm -hmm. the, you know, everybody's core motivation I know. Um, but that is a very, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a daunting uh, uh, scenario in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, although you, you again, um, kind of explain well how it is that there's a path forward. Mm -hmm. Um, with this and how it is that a radical acceptance person can see the opportunity and also see again that this universal recognition that we, the pandemic is, as you and I were pointing, you were pointing out before we went on air, you know, there's nobody that hasn't dealt with this. Yeah. So these kids are dealing with it, of course, but they see their parents mm -hmm. and their neighbors and mm -hmm. their grandparents, et cetera. And there's got to be something to be uh, to be uh, extracted and well utilized mm -hmm. from the fact that that's a universal experience. I yes. would think it is. It's this collective experience that we've all gone through, and there have been some wonderful people in the community who've also articulated this as well. It whether you choose to call it, you know, chronic stress um, or collective trauma. It's had an impact, you know, neurologically on us, physically on us, emotionally on us, but we've all experienced it together. And, and to varying degrees, depending on your resources, depending on your privilege, depending on so many things, 
what we can do is acknowledge that and name it and radically accept, okay, now how can we help each other? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to uh, actually change gears. I asked you about how things have been this year. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'll just remind folks that, that part of my motivation for asking you in um, today was the your discussing of a report that was provided for the school committee and that you know I'm sure is available um, and again that's the called the universal mental health screening and SEL assessment for Arlington Public Schools so it is the report that encapsulates for the moment as yes. you've been clear about um, where where things some of where things stand mm -hmm. um, in terms of our students mental health and just where, where they're at is that right yeah, so um, a universal mental health screener is not diagnostic. So it's, it's not. yeah, so I'm, I'm very particular in framing that Thank because you. it can be very easy to look at something that says mental health and to immediately attribute that to a mental health disorder or a mental health disease. And just like- Or mental health crisis. Correct, thank you. So just like physical health, you and I are sitting here right now with our own physical health and our own mental health. And I currently at the moment, I'll only speak for myself, right? I am feeling in good physical health and good mental health at the moment. Good for you. When we, thank you, when we say mental health though, in our community and society, we tend to attribute that with a negative Absolutely. stigma. And so I want to be very intentional in that part of the work we have to do around mental health is destigmatizing it. So when we say we're doing a mental health screener, we are not looking to pathologize all of our students. It's just like doing a vision screening or a hearing screening. Um, and when we do that with all of our you know, students with the nurse's office, it's the same exact thing, right? So we're just doing a universal screening of all of our students who opt into, you know, whose parents have given us the, the permission and to make sure that we're catching anybody who might need follow up with their doctors or pediatricians, mm -hmm. same exact thing. Um, that communication I feel is very pertinent at this moment in time until we destigmatize mental health because otherwise people will look at that and say, whoa, look at all these numbers, look at all these mentally unstable students, and that is not at all the case. So thank you for allowing Excellent. me to clarify Superb that. Superb clarification, absolutely, Great. and very necessary. So thanks, thanks for that. Absolutely. Um, but let me ask you, um, you gave this presentation to the school committee. Is that something that you do each year? Um, or was this a by by special request? Um, yeah, Dr. Holman had asked me to um, give a, a brief report out on where we were because we have just received a, a rather large grant from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So it's not something that we necessarily share out every year. This is actually only the second year that we have been um, in process with our universal mental health screenings. So we couldn't have been doing them for the past five years because we haven't been doing it. Mm -hmm. But we did just receive a $350,000 grant from the state and it's from federal funds that are specifically targeted to COVID needs around mental health uh, structures and supports, uh, specifically around SEL coaching and around universal mental health screenings, and there, there are a lot of specific parameters. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Homan asked that I report out on a couple of the data points that are connected to the grant funding so that school committee and the community could hear about where the funding's going, um, what programming around the universal screening is going to be supported from that. And I will just kind of point out to our viewers that if you are interested in knowing where that funding is going, um, Sarah does a great and quite comprehensive job in that school committee presentation, <laughs> which you can find on ACMI. I think it was um, maybe three weeks ago or so, probably mid-February school mm -hmm. committee meeting. If you are interested, we're not going to be we're not going to be going into that uh, mm -hmm. here today. Um, but I I was struck um, in listening to your presentation. Um, and a little bit in in the responses of the school committee members, but. Um, around how numbers as presented in the report could have people going ah! or you know all kinds of things because you know one of one of them is that it said um, you did a, an assessment of uh, it was a screening as you were saying mm -hmm. um, and that um, 
from sixth to to eleventh grade, um, the average of uh, people who would be um, manifesting that they that they could use a little that they're, they're they're starting to struggle a little bit or not people the kids that are they're starting to struggle a little bit, you know, goes from a kind of a, in an average year it might be something like ten to twenty five percent, and now we're we seem to be looking at numbers more like 20 to 40 percent. Thank you very much for yeah. for putting that up on the screen there. I figured that's uh, what you're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah. So so put, give us some context for this because mm -hmm. you know clearly the situation is concerning. It's probably not alarming. Mm -hmm. uh, we need context. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So what we're looking at here is uh, last year's data. At the end of the year. So this is so when... So 2020, 2021? Uh, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So last year we used a screener from out of UCLA and it was um, a trauma screener specifically created for time around COVID actually. It was sensitive to the fact that when we are in the midst of COVID, and this is when a lot of our students were at, we actually, all these screeners were given when our students were still virtual, virtual. Mm -hmm. or hybrid, right? So um, not in person all the time. And what we did was we selected this screener because we wanted to make sure that we were sensitive to the specifics of the COVID setting. We didn't want to send out a screener around anxiety and then have 90% of our students say, yes, I'm anxious all the time and have it be because of the context of COVID, not because of an internal rumination on obsessive thoughts and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and the COVID screener was evidence-based out of the one that we used. And it was really good at sussing out the difference between those students for whom their, um, their feelings and experiences were actually impacting their functioning. So that's why we picked it. A number of other colleagues in uh, similar districts were a part of a coalition called the Massachusetts uh, Health and School Mental Health Coalition in the state. We're using the similar one too. So we were uh, partnering with a number of other like-minded colleagues. And they also were using the similar screener. And as a matter of fact, they came out with uh, similar rates. And so it was reassuring to realize that this is actually just the state of how students were feeling and how they were experiencing things. So what you're looking at, um, everywhere from, I think it was 19% at the sixth grade up to 38% at the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. This is the percentage of students who screened in on that screener um, in the moderate or highly elevated range. So this isn't looking at just severe, this is looking at that whole swath of students that we responded to. Mm -hmm. And when we did respond, it was uh, one to two different actions we would take. We would look at the data and we would, for the students that were severely um, elevated, we would call home or meet with the students or a combination of both and say, hey families, remember that screener that we were going to have your students uh, complete? Their scores indicated that they're probably going to benefit from talking to somebody or from meeting with some type of an out patient clinician. Do you already have a therapist? Do you already work with a team? Um, if you do, would you like to have these results from the screener? You know, can we get a, would you be interested in signing a release of information so we can partner with you and we can work more collaboratively? Because all the research and data says, you know, as much as everyone in a child's life can circle up around them and have them be the center, the, so much better in terms of outcomes for that student. So that's what the goal was for students who are highly elevated was let's either get them somebody to really support them or if they already have that person, let's really circle up around them. And if it was more of a moderate level, what we offered was small group skills groups, whether it was uh, coping skills or stress management or psychoeducation, like mm -hmm. this is what happens when things get really stressful. Your heart rate goes up, your breathing starts to get shallow, and this is how you become aware of it and how you can sort of prevent that from happening or interrupt it. And we offer that to all these students. So it's really, it's a high number, and all of these students were offered those opportunities in a year that was really critical. And we also did progress monitoring. So that would basically mean anybody who took part in the group, also at the end of every session, they filled out a couple questions that said basically, how are you feeling? And just overly simplifying it. 
And our progress monitoring that came back to us from fifth grade through 12th grade showed that overall it was an upward trend. So students who participated in the groups, and they were all virtual, mind you, these were not in person, mm -hmm. um, overall reported increase in their feeling states throughout the process of their six-week group. That was a positive on, from the screening team perspective because students participated in the groups, but they also felt better as a result of participating. Yeah. So and that, that was great. What you're just saying, it, this is wonderful to have this conversation yeah. because otherwise we're left with graphs like this mm -hmm. and the graphs say, oh my God, look at, the pro look, look at this, yes. how dramatic, and they don't include, oh, what are we doing about that? Okay. And the fact that, you know, that number of close to 40% of 11th graders, well, they were all offered a suite of services mm -hmm. as a result of this screening. And the, whichever of them participated, as you yeah. were just saying, it, it worked to the degree that they felt better, they felt uh, better on the whole. So super important to be able to, again, dig down below these numbers yeah. um, and find out, again, what's being done, what's really happening mm -hmm. here, not just what is being you know reported in a certain way by yes. looking at at data in a certain data is just one piece of information, right? Here's the so here's the the group participation rates, right? So the the yellow bars are the total response of students who were who would be eligible for mm -hmm. a group participation, right? Because we offered that not just to the students who came up in the moderate, but also the severe, right? So the the full percentages, all those students we saw on the first graph, were all offered the groups, and you can see that those in the blue were the ones who then participated. So, you know, elementary age, the younger you are, the more excited you are to participate or the more excited your parents are to have you participate. Mm -hmm. And actually, the high schoolers were pretty into it because they were completely virtual. So any opportunity to be in community, they, they kind of jumped at it. It mm -hmm. was more so we saw um, a little bit of a, of a gap the older that they got, but um, even the high schoolers who participated in the groups still reported out that they were feeling better by the end. So this is also another nice data point to have in yeah. terms of seeing the participation from the students who I, were offered the groups. I, I, I agree with that, and I am struck, I have to say, and again, you know, we've just been talking about how, hey, these 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 graphs and these data representations that we're looking at, they, they don't really tell the whole story, mm -hmm. et cetera. But something that's quite striking there is, and I'm just going to ask you kind of somewhat anecdotally or based yeah. on your experience, is what's happening there uh, in ninth grade, which is the only place where more children or, or more kids opted out um, rather than in, um, for these, and that's the only the only one there. Does that have to do with uh, being in ninth grade? Like coming, you know, you're coming into a, a brand new situation. Ninth grade is fraught in a yeah. lot of ways anyway. So you have to think about this. Our ninth graders last year had never stepped foot into the high school. They had never met the counselors and social workers who were running the groups, and they probably didn't know the students that were in the groups mm -hmm. with them. So we, we were not surprised by the low engagement of the ninth graders. Um, and it's actually, um, you know, and wearing my counseling hat now, it's actually a group that we continue to follow through this year as sophomores because they, as a transitional year that we know is a particularly vulnerable year, they are a group that we want to make sure are particularly held and mm -hmm. monitored and supported. So it's not surprising at all that only roughly 50% of the students that were eligible participated in a group because that takes a lot of courage to sit there and to say, I'm struggling a bit. That's why this group is even offered to me. And now I'm going to be brave, even in the midst of my struggling, and join a virtual group with adults I don't have relationships with and potentially kids I don't, I don't have relationships no. with, that's, that's gutsy even for a ninth grader who's doing just fine. 
So that's that's not surprising at all. I'd be hard pressed to think of adults who <laughs> who would join uh, that group. Well, well, absolutely. So. And in fact, as you describe that, and I'm thinking back to you know many, many, many uh, groups of ninth graders that I that I saw while te while being yeah. a high school teacher myself. Um, I I'm actually quite amazed that yeah. uh, that you got almost fifty percent of them to say yes to that mm -hmm. uh, because you just described it. It's Ninth grade is all about overcoming uh, fears of, you know, like people you don't know, like peers and adults that you have to start building relationships with, et cetera, mm -hmm. at a time in your life when you're already dealing with a whole bunch of other stuff developmentally, yeah. as we know. Uh, so, you know, I don't think anybody ever looks back on their ninth grade year as the, being the apex of their, you know, schooling experience anyway. But this is a particular, this group, I'm, I'm glad and mm -hmm. not surprised to hear that you are paying particular attention to because, um, you know, it's tough enough, mm -hmm. as we've said, and then trying to do it under the circumstances that people, that, that we were in, in the, in the fall of 2020. Yeah. Oh, that's, so anyway, yeah. thanks, th thanks um, for that context. Absolutely. Um, I know that another piece of the report that you gave uh, or the presentation you gave and so it's probably in the report as well has to do with students self assessment like yes. um, and I am curious how meaningful a factor is students self assessment as you you know take the the data and the information that you're getting here and and decide what you're going to do with mm -hmm. it so uh, the, the self-assessment that you're speaking of is, so switching gears here now from the mental health assessment, which is going through uh, an evidence-based, very well-researched and vetted you know, external data point that is something that students complete and then the score tells them externally, you know, this is the cutoff score and this is where you're at. Mm -hmm. That's to the side and now you've switched over to the social emotional learning indicator score. You're, you're absolutely which right. Is, which is, no, 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 it's great. I'm, um, again, this will be my like clarity of <laughs> helping folks to understand because sometimes we'll say, we'll use interchangeably things like assessments or surveys and so on. And they're in terms of my field, especially since I, I sort of have these two departments and these two hats, sometimes they get blurred a bit. So the social emotional learning indicator score is a learning assessment. So just like we have, uh, you know, units, tests for mathematics and, you know, comprehension scores for literacy, we have, we actually have a way of assessing your social emotional learning competency mm -hmm. learning scores, your, your skills there, which is very different, different from, from assessing your vision, your hearing, mm -hmm. your mental health. Or your health. mental health. Your right. mental health. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. So um, having established that, one of the ways that we can assess your SEL skills is through a score called CELIS. And that is a collection of some really great questions that students do self-report on. Um, and it is collected through, uh, through the state and a couple of other uh, pieces of software that we have locally. And there are different developmentally appropriate questions. So there's a different set of questions for elementary, for middle, for high. and um, and they are based on the five different competencies. So there's questions around self-awareness, questions around relationship skills, and so on. And they're really lovely when you go through them because it is the student's self-reflection on those competencies that report back to them and to us how well they rate themselves in that skill. And then we have the ability to look at their scores, but also then to look at their scores as compared to other peers in the same grade level, other peers uh, across the state potentially, mm. and that skill as compared to other competencies. So as a student, you can get back those five competencies and say, you know, overall, I'm doing, you know, average for my grade level, arguably, but I'm really strong in self-awareness. I'm just not so great in self-management, or I'm really great with decision-making, but my relationship skills could use some health help. So it's a really dynamic mm -hmm. way of looking at data, and it's definitely not a two-dimensional bar graph. 
It's got lots of deep analysis that's available for students to look at. And you can even look at item analysis and so on and so forth. So what I was able to share at the school committee was really just an image, just one picture and a snapshot that says, on the whole, you know, our students are looking, self-assessing themselves around a 500 on a scale um, that could be much larger, uh, up to 700s. So, you know, our students are overall scoring themselves around the 24th percentile. And that's 24th percentile of all the people who are scoring themselves in this in, in, in this particular yes. And so, overall, our students are ranking themselves lower than average. They're viewing their SEL skills as lower than average in terms of, I was just looking at self-awareness, but these, um, as an example, but for all five competencies, our scores are all solidly in the 500s. Hmm. Yep, and um, you know, to give you an idea in terms of the, the profiles, you know, what's the difference between a 500 and a 700, right? So we talk about, okay, students for self-awareness, they're aware of their strengths. Um, but it's hard for them to take risks. So, for example, if you're looking at a student in class, you know, they're not going to raise their hand mm -hmm. if they're not sure mm -hmm. that they have the right answer. So it'll be one of those moments where you just sit there and it's silent. Whereas a student who is more of a 700 in self-awareness, they're going to raise their hand and say, I'm not sure if this is it, but I'm going to go for it, right? Because they're okay with taking risks. They do feel confident in themselves, that sense of self-worth even if they don't have the right answer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it, that's <laughs> just one example. Which may make them popular with themselves, you know, which may score them higher on, on this uh, scale, but probably may not, may not endear them to their classmates <laughs> Maybe, but it also has to come down to um, <sighs> doing hard work, right? So students who are in the 500 um, don't necessarily have the confidence in themselves to do hard work. So if they're given a task or an assignment, they might check out or moan and groan about it or not commit themselves to doing the work because they don't believe that they can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their sense of whether or not they're capable is lower, whereas a student who's in the 700 is like, oh, this is a hard task and I can do hard things. And that's, isn't that what we all want for our students Absolutely. is not necessarily the confidence in that I'm a know-it-all, but rather, oh, there's something difficult in front of me, and I am resourceful, and I have skills, and I can do hard things. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we're working towards. Um, and that's, that's the way we wanted to communicate that, is that the, the SEL skills are not just, do you know what self-awareness is? Can you check in and see how you're feeling? But when it comes down to learning in an environment, can you sit in a classroom, and when there's time for a discussion and someone else has a different opinion from you and your group, can you share your opinion? Do you feel like you need to conform to what the group is sharing? Do you know your identity? Can you then do something that's hard in front of you and ask for help when you need help? That's all tied into SEL skills. Right. And so just a couple of things, and, and then we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll wrap things up. Um, just a couple of things coming from this. One is, clearly, this is all about SEL skills, as you were just saying, this particular assessment and these, the numbers, 500, 700, and then these descriptions that people can see or did see on the screen when we were showing it. Um, so two things. One is, do you know, um, and is there much... Um, much priority placed on whether there's a correlation between these SEL skills and then academic performance. Mm -hmm. That's question number one. And question number two, sorry to give you both because they're not really related. Number two is, is one of the goals or intentions of this to um, provide useful information for the students themselves? Is that primary or how does that compare to the goal of what you can do with this data in terms of? Oh, know. I love those two questions. OK. So yes, there is a, a, an endless amount of, of research that has shown that when you have students who are developing and have strongly developed SEL skills, it has a massive impact on their academic skills. 
Absolutely, that's the whole foundation of the, the field. It wouldn't exist if it didn't <laughs> show that. So I'm more than happy to, to share some of those, um, those research reports and the links and so on, but um, at easiest, castle.org, C-A-S-E-L.org. You can go there and there's massive research pages that show it. Um, the other thing too, even just economically, for every $1 invested in social emotional learning education at the school level, equals $11 in the municipality of savings because that's money saved from what you have found. Services. Oh, everything. Yeah. So there are massive benefits to social emotional learning when you're investing in it. And yes, you find that students are um, oh, growing with leaps and bounds in terms of the academics. Um, and it, it's just beautiful to, to <laughs> dig into it. I'm going to shut down that part of my brain. I'm going to shut down that part of my brain. But the other thing I'm going to speak to is you asked about to share it with students. That's actually my favorite thing to do with the Celis data. Sharing it with teachers is great because to see their eyes light up and think about all the different instructional ways that they can use the data to support the students is really exciting. But to share it with individual students is fascinating and creative and fun because they can look at it and they can say, oh, wow, yes, I am really good at that. And that is my superpower because it does. It shows you very specific superpowers that mm -hmm, kids have mm -hmm. that are much higher than other peers within their classroom. And, they, and it's really pinpointed. And they're able to look at it and say, I am really good at making friends with new kids in the classroom when they come in. And that's not something other people do. But what I'm not great at is sitting with people in you know the lunchroom that I'm not already friends with. Mm -hmm. And it's not a deficit-based assessment. So they don't need to look at it and say, how do I fix all these things right. that are wrong? Right. Which is unlike any other content area. What they can do is they can look at all their superpowers and then say, how do I explode those things that are great? And that's actually, if you look at anybody who's majorly successful, they didn't look at their weaknesses and say, how do I bring those up to be average. They looked at their strengths and said, how do I get to be incredible in my strengths? And that's what you can do with the students is you can sit there and say, what are you great at? And how do you become even more incredible? Well, the, the students and adolescents that I uh, remember <laughs> um, and still work with actually and still, still hang out with because I, I do love that age group, um, you know, I think just getting that message from, a, from adult or adults that they trust yes. that says, it's fine for you to concentrate on the things that you're great at yeah. and to see how to make those work even better for you right. and not naturally go to that place where adolescents spend a lot of time, as we know, mm -hmm. of just kind of like, oh, you know, oh, I can't do this, I can't yeah. do that, I'm not good at this and not good at that. So I, I love that yeah. idea that you that this would introduce conversations mm -hmm. that not only bring that to light for them, but also give them a way to kind of feel great yes. about it. So, Because what do we do as adults? The things that for us are on the weakest side, we, we use life hacks for or we outsource them, right? So <laughs> I use alarms to help me stay prompt and on time, uh -huh. right? I don't, I haven't prioritized that as a life skill. I've just accepted, eh, it's not my strong suit. I'll set an alarm for mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. We can teach kids to do the same thing. That's not your strong suit. Use a, some other tool to do it for you and now spend your energy doing the things that you love. Well, um, I love the fact that we've been able to wrap up again uh, what was promised and has been in fact a wide ranging conversation um, with uh, really kind of focusing on both the value of SEL, this work that you are doing in the schools, um, you know, uh, again, mostly around students and their experience, kids, you know, young people and how they are navigating the, the world. Mm -hmm. But also, nice that it's good for academic performance too. Yes. Um, and then, and then uh, secondarily, just kind of this, this overall sense that you project of energy and positivity and optimism, which, again, is a great note on which to end this conversation. So. <laughs> Um, I know you have plenty of work to do still in front of you the rest of the year and on from there. Um, I do hope that we can speak more regularly. Um, sure. There are a couple of things that I, uh, that came up in our conversation okay. today that I would love to delve into a little bit more um, with you in future iterations. But I will, for today, say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. 
I have been speaking, of course, with Sarah Bird, who is a director of counseling and social and emotional learning here at Arlington Public Schools. I'm James Milan. This has been Talk of the Town. Thanks so much to Sarah for joining us, and thanks you, thanks to you as well. We'll see you next time. Thank you.